Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Tuggle. I'm one of the co-organizers of this workshop, along with um, James Coltis. Um, if you can see him, raise your hand, James. Um, and Nicole uh, Scott is the one organizing the, the actual call itself. I just have a couple of slides to start. I won't take too much time uh, of Zipeng's uh, presentation, but uh, it looks like we'll have close to 100 or more people in the um, workshop today. So just a couple of housekeepings. Please mute your microphone, um, uh, especially during the speakers. And then later, um, we'll be able to uh, talk, talk more uh, openly. Uh, what we're going to try to do is use the chat for questions um, and use the format with a speaker's name so that they know the question is directed to them. And they'll try to answer those privately uh, during the next speaker's presentation. Uh, just a comment that this workshop is supported by an AG2 PIC grant to James and myself. And um, uh, just to give you an idea, this is this is one of the activities as part of that seed grant. And if you're interested in participating um, in other types of activities like this, and you'd like to organize one, there's new opportunities for seed grant funding at at the work at the um, ag2pi.org website. Uh, the th round three applications are due March 9th, I believe is the date. Um, you can certainly look online. Uh, and there are also working group applications that don't have a submission date. So you can you can submit those at any time. Um, and Nicole has, has provided a little bit more information about that in the chat. Um, so just to get started on the in the workshop schedule, uh, on the left, you can see what our plan is. Um, what we're planning to do with the speakers first is to they'll help us um, understand uh, the, the the general area here, the uh, ag uh, uh, genomics data torrent um, idea of data reuse as being quite important. And we are, we really want to get your input and discussion. So we are giving you multiple opportunities. Um, Nicole will put in the chat uh, the Google Doc link. We'll have a Google Doc set up to provide your suggestions on two things. If you think that there's a working group that's not listed uh, on that Google Doc, and those Google those uh, working groups are coming from the Ag Biodata um, website, uh, where that group uh, is already working in this space, and Leonora will will provide a um, detailed information about that. But provide your suggestions on new working groups um, and any discussion items that you think are important, uh, and then we'll have that roundtable discussion um, uh, at uh, after all the speakers are finished. And we'll compile, um, we've got a, a Qualtrics survey started and we'll, as soon as possible after the workshop is ended, uh, we'll go ahead and send that uh, Qualtrics survey out to all the registrants of the workshop. So that'll help us collect your interest um, and uh, in, in, a, in workshop uh, participation. Uh, so um, if without any further ado, let me introduce the first speaker. It's uh, Zipeng Wang, who's a professor in biochemistry and molecular biotech. Um, at uh, University of Massachusetts, and she's the Lee Weibo Chair in Biomedical Research. So she's been a leader of the Ag and uh, sorry <laughs> of the Encode Project on transcriptional regulation uh, and in developing bioinformatic resources. And she's going to talk to us today on those tools. And her talk is entitled "Web-Based Tools for User Access to a Registry of Regulatory Elements in Human and Mouse." So I'll turn it over to Ziping. So I, I see that you're muted. You? There you are. Me? Yep. Now you're good. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Chris, for inviting me to present our work today. Um, so let me just get started since I have quite a few slides. Um, okay. Did that work? Okay. So um, you probably are quite aware of um, why we need to um, study the regulatory regions in the genome. So um, only 1.5% of the human genome encodes proteins. And for the rest of the genome, um, there is a good chunk of it that's regulatory, even though the exact percentage of the rest of the genome that's regulatory is still being debated. So if you um, look at um, what 
recent research has been quite focused on is to understand the variation in the human population. And the NHGRI, um, EBI, GWAS, Genome-Wide Association uh, studies, um, they have this catalog that's growing really quickly. And if you look at the variants that are causing diseases or make a difference in human trait, 90% um, of them are not encoding regions. And uh, quite a few studies have shown that these variants are highly enriched in regulatory elements. So that kind of motivates a lot of our work in um, studying regulatory elements. So um, just a summary as to what kind of regulatory elements we're talking about. So we have um, promoters. Uh, why is it not advancing? OK, promoters, um, these are regions um, that are very close to the transcription star site, and uh, they um, recruit, help recruit um, the polymerase start transcription. And some of the promoters are active, some are repressed, and some are bivalent. And they are enhancers. These are regions that work at a distance, and they help promoters and also RNA pol 2 and they are silencers, repressors, and also insulators because the genome is like a linear space. And uh, these are demarcations to divide neighborhoods in the, in the linear genome so that they don't interfere with each other. So um, the goal of our study is um, try to define regulatory elements and to use these elements and their epigenetic activities to predict gene expression in a cell type specific manner. And because regulatory elements are enriched in these uh, traits, so one major application is through this study, then we can interpret genome-wide association study traits um, and their variants more, um, more, uh, with more mechanistic point of view. So I have been part of this um, ENCODE consortium, as Chris mentioned, um, stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Um, it is a two-decade effort that officially ended um, um, uh, on, uh, on February 1st this year, even though we are still continuing a lot of the data analysis to um, to to finish off phase four um, and also publications of the phase, uh, phase four. So here is a photo of the consortium during phase three. Um, and uh, um, the consortium in general has um, three goals. One is cataloging all functional elements in the genome, including those regulatory elements and transcribed elements. So anything that could be functional in the human genome and also uses mouse as a comparator. Um, also, it's, it's a community resource um, project. We want to develop freely available resources for the research community and study human and uh, mouse, as I said. Um, and uh, the project has uh, data generation, data analysis, and data repository. And specifically, I have been um, leading the effort of um, consortium-wide data analysis. And today I'm going to give you a glimpse of um, the resources we have prepared and uh, um, how, how to use them uh, for, for other applications. So um, here is, uh, it is the cover um, um, of uh, ENCODE 3 publication package uh, sometime in 2020 now. And uh, since then, we have continued to update the, um, the resources. So um, some of what I'm telling you today are already updated, and uh, some will come out at the end of the phase four publications. So. Um, we, um, we want to define these regulatory elements. So here is an epigenetic point of view of an enhancers. Um, it is a piece of DNA that's um, free of nucleosome bound by transcription factors, TFs here. Um, so um, ENCODE has performed a ton of um, chip-seq experiments of transcription factors. 
and uh, you use antibody, grab down a specific TF, and then you sequence the DNA. So you get signals like this. Um, and then um, we also have um, histone modifications, and also we have a ton of ChIP-seq data of those, and characteristic histone modifications indicate regulatory elements. So also, um, we have open chromatin regions. So if you want a piece of DNA to be uh, regulatory, um, it's very often um, devoid of a nucleosome. So it's like a naked DNA, and then you can use DNA seq and um, also attack seq to, um, to, to find these open chromatin regions. And uh, um, ENCODE has probably the biggest repository of DNA seq very high quality DNA seq data from John Stamatoyanopoulos' lab. So um, that is a, a core component of what we do. So if you look at the gene, for example, SP1 is a ubiquitously expressed transcription factor. Um, you can see that um, you have um, promoter regions, enhanced regions, um, insulator regions. They have very characteristic um, DNA seq signals and these um, two um, histone modification signals and uh, CTCF, which is the insulator binding protein. Um, th there is only CTCF in, in, in mammals. So um, you can see regions tend to be open chromatin, has uh, peaks. So all, in all my slides, um, th there is this color coding, um, H3K4ME3, which is a mark of uh, promoters. It's in red, promoters are in red and K4ME3 is also in red. K27AC is a mark for enhancers, um, it's in yellow. And the open chromatin is in green, DNAs. And insulator is in blue, CTCF binding. So what we do is uh, we take the over 1,000 um, DNA-seq experiments data in, across a whole range of um, cell and tissue types. So when you pile them up like this, you see these open chromatin peaks. Some of them are ubiquitous, some of them are cell type specific. So what we do is, um, I don't know, uh, my screen is very busy with a lot of zoom buttons. So I hope you can see that there are these black boxes at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we detect these regions that are open chromatin um, in, in any of our samples. And we have, uh, we call them representative DNA hypersensitive sites, um, so RDHSs. Um, we have um, millions of them, two million for ENCODE 3 um, in human. We have fewer of them in mouse simply because we don't have as many data sets. And we expect just data availability, otherwise, um, the numbers between human and mouse should be similar. So, um, when you have um, these RDHSs, and then we define another um, candidate cis regulatory elements. I'm sorry for the acronym, <laughs> but just remember CCREs is what we talk about a lot when we talk about regulatory elements, because we want to say these are candidate because they are defined by epigenetic signal. They haven't been validated. Okay, so CCREs. So CCREs are a subset of RDHSs that are further supported by these two histone marks and uh, um, CTCF binding. So any one of these three additional evidence will allow us to promote RDHS to a CCRE. Okay, at the end uh, for ENCODE 3, we define nearly 1 million CCREs and uh, for human and 340K CCREs for mouse. Um, since then, we have increased this number you know, with uh, uh, ENCODE 4 data. So um, among the human CCREs, so um, the, 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 there is a bar, here, there should be a bar here, but I hope you can see in my screen it's covered by some buttons. Um, so um, there are uh, promoter-like elements. So PLS is like promoter-like signatures. Yeah, I know it's quite, quite a bunch of acronyms, but I'll remind you, red, if you see the red color, we mean promoter-like, okay? And so enhancer-like elements, um, 142K of them are near transcription star sites, and then a huge chunk of them are distal. So these are distal ones, uh, enhancers. Um, and then there are some DNAs with only K4ME3 mark, but far away from transcription star site. And so they are likely either novel promoters or poised enhancers. We don't quite know yet. 
and at the end they are regions that are bound by CTCF only, but without any of these other marks, um, they, they are very likely really strong boundary elements or insulators. So um, this is um, human genome, uh, HG38, CCREs. That's a kind of like the compilation across all the ENCODE data set um, at the end of ENCODE phase three. So um, that's the compi compilation of all data. But if you look at a particular biosample, for example, like a hepatocyte here, and these are liver cells, um, not all 1 million are active. So usually you have like 100,000 of them being used in a particular cell type. So these are the ones, the blocks here, um, the gray ones are the ones uh, we don't think that are being used in a particular biosample. Um, so you have these red promoters and uh, yellow enhancers and then blue um, CTCL bound insulators and so on. So that's how we display them in a genome browser. And typically these are the breakdown and as I said, a bunch of them that are not used in this particular cell type. So um, um, these uh, CCREs are conserved on average um, at a relative uh, level and different classes um, have different levels of conservation. Promoters are the most conserved and then um, enhancers and uh, CTCF only insulators are actually not as conserved even though they are all more conserved than random. Um, we compared carefully the definition um, between human and mouse. Um, some of them are um, homologous and also CCREs in both species. Um, some are homologous only, but no longer CCRE in the other species. Um, just be wary that uh, there is this availability of mouse data. Um, so most of the um, mouse um, elements are conserved, in, are contained in human, but the other way around, um, the proportion is smaller. And the, and, and the synthetic regions um, tend to be more conserved as expected. So after this um, uh, work, um, we, we, we joined this other consortium called the Zoonomia Consortium, um, led by um, uh, Eleanor Carlson and uh, Shishin uh, Limbrato. Um, it, it's for um, 240 percental mammals, and uh, that gave us more um, power, statistical power to detect conserved elements compared with um, the 100 vertebrate um, s genomes we used in the, in the ENCO3 uh, manuscript uh, paper. Um, so um, because regulatory elements, they evolve quite quickly. And if we have uh, more genomes with more recent evolutionary time, we can better detect these, um, these conserved elements. So, so um, the conservation is indeed higher. Um, the solid lines are for um, um, 240 mammals and uh, compared with previously vertebrates in dashed lines. Um, we have a manuscript that's being uh, reviewed uh, to talk about the conserved elements. So, um, so that's kind of the overview of uh, CCREs and uh, um, and uh, conservation. So, we we since um, looked into specific subsets of CCREs. For example, some of them are a very high uh, open chromatin in almost all samples we have data. So there's a small, small portion of them. So we published the paper last year in NAR specifically describing these. So if you make a histogram of all the um, CCREs we're talking about, and here is RDHS, which is the superset of CCRE. Um, so you see this, there's this tail, okay? When you zoom in this tail, you see this, um, a number of them that are open chromatin in almost all the cell types, like 95% of all the cell types we have data. And then majority of them are um, promoters. So we call them, um, you see the red color. So we focus this paper on these um, ubiquitous PLS. And they're actually quite interesting. Um, I don't want to go into details here, but just a teaser if you're interested in such elements. Um, they are quite essential. Um, they are enriched in um, metabolic and uh, other cell essential um, functional categories. And uh, they are 
very very enriched in the cell essential genes as discovered by a uh, CRISPR screen. So um, so let me just move on and they have a um, distinct promoter shape, for example, not going into details, they're, they're high GC and uh, um, just comparison between the ubiquitous ones and the non-ubiquitous ones. And also, um, the ubiquitous ones are extremely conserved between human and mouse. Like this red ribbon is the ubiquitous promoters versus the blue ribbon here for the non-ubiquitous ones. Um, and we actually found them to be quite interesting in terms of the binding motif sites of transcription factors. Even though they are syntactically highly conserved, um, the motif sites actually turn over pretty quickly. And also, they show a high um, diversity in the human population. Um, without going into details, um, yeah, you can read the paper if you're interested in such a subset of elements. So um, today, I'm here to tell you these resources, right? How do we make these CCREs and uh, RDHSs and their associated annotations accessible to the outside world? Um, so we have um, built these resource. Um, let me see, put them, would it play? Ah, very good. Okay, so um, two uh, very talented MD-PhD students in my lab built this resource called a screen. And it's um, of the main um, ENCODE project website. And we have a built-in genome browser, which flashed by very quickly. You see the samples on the left here, uh, we have um, 1,500 samples now. You can select each one and you can go in and look at the individual um, CCREs that are accessioned. And uh, um, you can look at the nearby genomic features, um, transcription factor binding and histone modification. Uh, and you can link out for the transcription factors to the factor book, which is another resource I will quickly talk about after this one. And you can look at um, all these details. So, um, so yeah, give it a try uh, if you're interested in individual um, CCREs. Um, so I, I stress individual because other tools, um, the unit for other web tools is like a whole data set here. Um, the unit is one CCRE. So you can search with gene name, you can search with the SNP ID uh, coordinates, or you can search as a batch, batch file. You select between human and mouse. And here at the bottom is our built-in genome browser. These little boxes are the CCREs. And they are color-coded by um, promoter like enhancer like and the CTCF so this is consistent and then the scores and coordinate um, and uh, for each CCIE if you choose one and you can answer the question of in what uh, biological contexts is uh, this CCIE active and also um, uh, here is a zooming view, and it's, it's, you can zoom into individual uh, bases. They scale by a uh, conservation score. This is 100 uh, way vertebrate I mentioned earlier. And even like um, binding site of TFs, they pop up as um, in this zoomed in view. Quite interesting. Like you can tell which t transcription factors TFs would bind this CCRE. And uh, for the distal CCREs, um, it's very important to figure out which genes they regulate. So uh, our screen tool um, catalog these other genomic data sets like EQTLs, single cell um, perturbation QTL-like data, and uh, cheer pet and high C are two kind of uh, chromatin interaction, chromatin structure. Uh, data and all these we we curate uh, and code produce a lot of these kind of data we curate them and put them in screen and you can access them and if you choose one CCRE it will tell you which genes are linked by which data so we don't judge which one is more reliable than which one and you you basically um, get to know where we we get the data from and uh, so I mentioned briefly about factor book which is um, a resource which is very similar to screen. Instead of for CCREs, factor book is for transcription factors. 
That's why it's called the Factor Book. So it has been around for a while. So we published the Factor Book as、um, part of the Encode Phase Two effort in、um, 2012, and then we just put out a new paper、um, this year、uh, for for an update. So there is a ton of new things in Encode Three. So、uh, right now we have data on、uh, over 2,000、uh, transcription factor chip seq experiments.、Um, we have a bunch of、uh, annotations for each TF.、Um, so from these encode data, we have a binding motif catalog as shown in this UMAP with each dot as a different、um, uh, transcription factor motif. And we can annotate、uh, quite a few of them、um, previously not known to have、uh, sequence binding motifs. And for example, this is a, 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 a novel one, Zing Finger Four Hundred Seven, and we use、um, peak centrality conservation and、uh, footprint of、uh, DNA's cleavage to support that this motif is actually real. Um, so you can search it with a TF, obviously, and you get、uh, expression profile of this TF protein across、uh, encode data, and you can find out what kind of motif does this transcription factor recognize.、Um, you can upload your sequence to see whether or not it matches any motif. And、uh, so, so in, in in summary, so I just told you two tools. One is.、Um, Screen with CCRE and、uh, um, Factor Book for TF. So I started out with my talk by motivating we want to understand genome-wide、uh, association variants, and how do we use these tools to annotate GWAS variants? I'll just give you a very quick、um, example. So、uh, I mentioned this NHGRI EBI GWAS catalog.、Um, For Encode Three paper, we actually、um, processed all three thousand eight hundred studies that was they were available at that time, and now there are a lot more, and so we'll, we'll have an update.、Um, so for each one,、um, you can you can get the variants, try to use our data to predict、uh, causal variants, and then you can also identify the most relevant biosamples, which would be the biosamples that are most enriched. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the variance in in regulatory elements, so、um, one case study、um, which we put in our Encode Three paper was、um, so here. If you if you are interested in particular SNP,、um, this one is was reported in two studies to be associated with schizophrenia.、Um, The SNP itself does not overlap an element, a regulatory element. However, it's in high linkage disequilibrium with three,、uh, with thirty-nine SNPs, and six of these thirty-nine overlap regulatory elements. So we suspect that、um, the regulatory elements are actually what matters, and this particular SNP is just a tag SNP. Okay, so among these six regulatory elements, only one of them that have a high epigenetic signal in brain-related cells, as shown here in this table,、um, in brain cells, and、uh, schizophrenia,、um, you would suspect it's a brain-related disease. So you then you can delve in and look at、um, human and mouse data across all kinds of tissues. And also,、um, Encode has these mouse uh, developmental uh, fetal fetal、uh, series of embryonic day from ten point five to birth, and you can see the epigenetic signal over time. And then、um, you can zoom in and compare、um, the local sequence to see whether or not they're conserved and whether or not it overlaps a transcription factor binding site. And we actually went on and、um, teamed up with、um, Len Panakio's group to validate or test this particular SNP overlapping region in mouse transgenic mouse, and shown that it, indeed it's actually a, a, a regulatory element for mouse development. So、um, you can.、Um, Look at all these kind of、um, uh, analysis already done on on the GWAS、um, in the catalog in screen. You don't have to do this kind of analysis computationally. You can just access the results.、Um, you can select a GWAS and then select a cell or tissue type and then which CCIEs intersect the variant. 
And uh, you can also look at the variant in factor book. And uh, you can see which, um, which uh, regions uh, intersect with the other TF binding sites, which motif, and also whether or not um, the variant uh, overlap is, 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 uh, is uh, um, inside the motif as a reference allele or alternative allele, what kind of frequency it has. Um, we have all this data in Factorbook. So um, just to go back to our recent effort as part of the Zoonomia, and uh, we have an updated uh, list of uh, conserved transcription factor binding sites, and uh, they explain the heritability of a panel of 60 or so um, very broadly assayed um, uh, phenotypes pretty well. So. Um, just as, as a, a compilation of these regions, if you, if you want to take into account placental mammal conservation. And uh, you can go down the list of uh, the conservation. You can see the most conserved ones are the most enriched in, um, in human phenotypes. So, okay, so let me just sum it up. Uh, I hope I was clear enough. So today I told you about our uh, registry of CCREs that are defined using ENCODE data. Um, we have different classes um, based on epigenetic signal with putative functions. Um, we predict their activities and we have built a tool called a screen to en enable you to search individual CCREs and, and uh, their annotations. And I also mentioned the factor book which is a, a resource for transcription factors, um, human and the mouse and uh, their motifs. And I mentioned um, GWAS integration as a motivation for the applications of these two tools. And uh, um, GWAS SNPs are highly enriched in cell type specific CCREs and screen can display these cell types and uh, the CCREs associated with GWAS SNPs, and Factorbook can further annotate the SNPs with candidate uh, TF binding and uh, allele um, uh, out and uh, reference allele uh, nucleotides. You can see them zoom down to individual nucleotide level. And we're further leveraging the recent um, uh, placental mammal conservation to increase the power of these elements, both uh, TF and CCREs. So um, let me just thank the people who did the work. So um, this is a team of really, really talented people in my lab who really carried the weight. Um, Jill Moore um, is, um, is, the, is the major driving force behind the registry of CCREs. Um, Michael and Henry built a screen and uh, Ayang, Kylie, and Greg um, did additional analysis um, that I sprinkled throughout the uh, project, um, especially um, the, the Zoonomia consortium effort at the end. And of course, um, we, we wouldn't be here today without the wonderful data of um, the ENCODE consortium members. So these are really high quality data. We're, we're trying to integrate and figure out the, the annotation and function, make them more useful for, for everybody else. But, but they really came from the data themselves. And the really high quality ENCODE data um, has enabled us to do a lot of wonderful things um, with annotation and understanding um, genome function. So that's all I have today. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, uh, it was a great talk. And I, there are some questions in the chat, um, but I think we'll move on um, to um, try to get back on time. So I, my next presentation, or, or the next presentation, is by Leonora Reiser who is at Phoenix Bioinformatics in California. She has the interesting title of Data Wrangler, um, and she'll describe today the large consortium called Ag Biodata and its plans to encourage a healthy bioinformatics environment for agriculture. So her title of her talk is the Ag Biodata Research Consortium Network, ensuring fair agricultural data through community-based standards. So Leonore, the floor is yours. All right, do we see my slides and we hear me speaking? The, yep. standard, the standard, I'm on the Zoom now. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. So like um, 
Like Chris said, I'm here representing the Ag Biodata Research Coordination Network. And um, I'm a member of the steering committee um, and have been for the last uh, couple of years. And so I'm going to try and quickly step through these slides. Uh, hold on. Okay, so what is Ag Biodata? So just a little bit of history is that the Ag Biodata network itself was established in 2015 at a plant and animal genome conference. And this was a group of people working at what we call genetic and genomic and breeding databases who all got together and realized that we were facing a lot of uh, similar issues related to data management and data handling. And so we became this um, loosely federated uh, group of what's now currently about 35 member um, genetic, genomic and breeding resources. Um, and although unfunded, we were able to scrounge a bit of um, money together to have a first official meeting that we held in Utah in 2017. And this is where we actually formed some initial working groups and came up with um, some recommendations, oops, sorry, for um, sort of how you know, GGB databases um, can um, be more accessible and fair. And it also um, got us working together to um, do some grant writing that eventually result resulted in this um, NSF funded research coordination um, network grant that um, was started in September of 2021. So I'm gonna um, step through the, the aims of this, of this grant. So we're sort of starting from a, a group of uh, researchers and databases with a um, overarching goal of making agricultural um, genomic data more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So our aim is to have fair data ecosystem. And in order to do that, we have um, a, a goal of making recommendations for implementation of standards for fair data. Um, our, another goal is to expand our network to ensure inclusivity, diversity, and equity. We have an aim of uh, creating and testing a fair data management training materials and curriculum. So, you know, once we've sort of established what these um, procedures are, we then need to be able to sort of disseminate that broadly so that people who are uh, data generators know how to make their data fair. Um, and then uh, uh, we have also a goal of making uh, this uh, GGB resources uh, more sustainable. Because of course, if uh, databases disappear, then that data disappears and it's no longer fair. So um, as it was mentioned before, we have um, a number of working groups that we established. So again, we launched this project in September um, and then we've um, uh, gotten our, our working groups. We sort of have an initial set of nine working groups that we've established. And I'm just going to very briefly provide an overview of what those working groups are. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are working groups that have um, expressed um, interest in having um, additional um, participants, though I think that all of the working groups would welcome um, more engagement. So we have a data federation working group and their goals are around developing and implementing um, best practices to promote accessibility and interoperability of um, data and databases. There is a working group on what we call data collection accuracy and precision. So obviously, you know, we have to make sure that in order for data to be fair, that we need to uh, collect this data in ways that will ensure um, that we have, um, you know, the, the appropriate amount of information to make it accessible in the long run. And so their goals are around identifying what the problems are with the accuracy and precision, and then to make recommendations and best practices going forward. Um, there's a standards for genetic variation data working group, which aims to address the coordination and access of genetic variation data for agronomically important species. Um, and then again, to prepare some recommendations and best practices guidelines. And I should say that these working groups, um, they meet with varying degrees of frequency. Some meet you know, twice a month, some once a month. Um, and there's a schedule um, on the website that explains when those working groups are meeting. 
Uh, the next set of working groups are genome assembly and annotation nomenclature. Um, so that aims to create a unified nomenclature system for gene model names, for annotations and genome assemblies, and provide guidelines for um, formatting uh, files and genome assemblies for um, genome assemblies. If you don't know, you know for sure what your gene is, then you're going to really have a hard time associating data to it. So this is really, really critical in the area of um, a genome a week kind of uh, data ecosystem. There's a genotype to phenotype data working group which aims to improve the collection um, and data sharing in order to um, enhance the identification of genotype phenotype associations and to define the data and metadata um, for those associated studies. Um, there is a pan genomes working group um, that aims to promote rep reproducible and well-documented pipelines and identify the roles that the pan genomes and their visual and visualization and analysis will play and then to um, hopefully find ways of improving and connecting phenotype data to these pan genomes, because now we're not just doing one genome for a species, but many. Um, there's an ontologies working group that um, uh, is also a carryover from those very early groups. And they're hoping to develop recommendations and best practices and training materials for ontology use and to understand, of course, what the limitations are for ontology usage. There is a recruiting working group, and that is, um, I'm actually a part of that working group, and we aim to ensure that there is equity, diversity, and inclusivity within our working groups and across the consortium by engaging with a broader um, population of stakeholders that includes um, a, a wide variety of different data generators, consumers, people from different um, institutions, academic backgrounds, and so on. Um, and then a uh, very critical again to our aims is the education working group, which is um, really crucial for ensuring that um, as, as we um, develop and create more data that people understand how to manage their data fairly to, and, um, to ensure that this persists going forward. So um, in addition to these nine working groups, we also have plans for a few additional working groups um, in future years. Uh, critical to these is a sustainability working group. So part of the, um, the activity at Phoenix Bioinformatics is around ensuring that um, uh, data and databases are able to, um, to uh, be sustainable. And so uh, we have plans to work on sort of a roadmap for, for genetic genomic database um, sustainability. And also um, in the, so this is a three-year RCM. So in the third year of RCM, we also have um, uh, plans for an implementation working group that will take the activities of those um, and, and the recommendations of the, of the working groups and sort of develop strategies, uh, particularly with um, funders and publishers to ensure that those um, standards are actually um, implemented. And you know, recognizing that um, there are emerging data types, we also um, are proposing community-driven working groups around these emerging data types that will come up in years uh, two and three of the grant. Um, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of overlap with this um, particular community. And so, you know, some of the things to uh, think about are, you know, where are there um, areas of overlap of interest? And of course, you know, where are there gaps? You know, we've, all, I've, we've only described nine um, working groups and there's a lot of other um, uh, community suggested working groups that people have um, um, talked about within the Ag Biodata Consortium that we were not able to implement. For example, there was a working group that was interested on in remote sensing data. Um, and of course, um, for Ag Biodata, um, our, many of our working groups are not as well represented um, with um, members from outside of the plant um, or even insect community. So we definitely welcome more engagement from people who are in um, working with other um, agriculturally important species with like brains and hooves and things like that. 
Um, so I'm just going to sort of end it up with here and say, you know, if you're interested in joining any of the working groups, um, you know, we would like you to contact us um, to find out more. We're also holding what we're calling our first community networking um, and feedback event, which is going to be March 15th through 17th. And this is going to be a three day event where um, each of the uh, each day three of the working groups will um, give brief, brief presentations and we're going to have some breakout rooms where people can engage with those um, working groups to be able to offer feedback um, and this might be an opportunity for folks who are interested in participating in the working groups to um, uh, to find out more about it and there's a lot of other um, things that we're that we have available and information that's on the website and I encourage people to go and um, take a look and ask more questions if you have and I think that's all I'm going to present okay <laughs> great thank you very much Leonor uh, it was a great summary of AG, ag bio data uh, I'm sure that people are interested there's a there's a, at least one question in the chat I think we're having a little trouble with making sure that the participants are able to ask to everyone. Um, so we'll make sure that those get get to the speakers, at least if not to everyone. Um, but let's go ahead and and uh, and move on then. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Peter Harrison, uh, who's in uh, a team leader in genome analysis um, at the European Bioinformatics Institute. Uh, his team has a number of different projects. But the part I know best is that he's providing data resources uh, for both plant and animal genome research. And his talk is on the animal side of this. Uh, and will and he's titled it uh, the Fang Data Portal, Current and Future Prospects. So um, we'll go ahead and have you start, Peter. Thanks. Hey, thanks very much, Chris. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk a bit about the functional annotation of animal genomes projects, um, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, but just to to reiterate, this is a, a coordinated international effort to provide high quality functional annotation of animal genomes focused mainly on livestock and agriculture communities, but does extend to other species as well. And really this, this project has a core focus of data openness, reusability through rich metadata and standardization to try and create a harmonized rich genome to phenome resource across a range of these uh, projects that, that collaborate together. And then also we have within Europe, uh, uh, sort of particularly coordinated effort between a group of Horizon 2020 funded projects called Eurofang. Uh, and these are really trying to, to really focus around um, improving animal production and welfare within Europe by working very closely together. So really this is a global collaboration. There's a steering committee and, and scientific advisory board and its own working groups focusing on a range of key data reuse aspects. But because it's really comprised of these multiple individual funded grants and groups that are spread all over the world, we really have a key role in ensuring that we have strong coordination standardization um, across the, the projects. And that's really what, what my team um, does for, for FANG, which is act as a data coordination center to try and um, take the, the lead from the steering committee and these working groups to try and ensure that our data is as standardized and fair as possible. So um, really the FANG projects are already uh, sort of exemplifying data reuse within their design. So there's already strong um, data reuse from some of the earlier projects within FANG, because it's been going for about five, six years now, and really ensuring that, that through the standardization process that, that people can reuse um, as much data as possible and get as much value as possible from the, fun, from the funders for the data that we're generating. So really the FANG data portal provides a sort of single access point to all of the FANG metadata and data and publications produced by the project. And this is because it collects all of the data that's spread across various public archives, pulls it all into one place to make it as reusable and accessible as possible and provides direct download from all these various underlying archives in a single place. It also actually automatically identifies data set reuse. Um, so any publication that uses any of the data from FANG, um, we're able to detect that and then we link those publications back to the original data sets. So you can see the growing research building around some of these key data sets within FANG. We try and provide intuitive search and filtering and we also have sort of sub project pages because we're representing so many different funded projects to try and exemplify what each individual project is producing. Really what, what I feel makes this collection so special is that we have this sort of really rich and consistent and validated metadata descriptions for all of the FANG data sets. And this is sort of centered around the fact that there's also a standardization around what assays are done, how the different experiments are performed, 
um, what um, histone marks they're using in chip seek analysis, for example, and really trying to coordinate across, um, despite the fact that it's a global consortium of individual funded projects to ensure that the data is as harmonized as possible. To try and aid this, we have mandatory sampling, experiment, and analysis protocols connected to each data set, and really provide a lot of detail about how every individual analysis um, and sampling uh, event has been performed. And now we have many of the projects also using standardized analysis pipelines to try and further this standardization. So you can take two data sets generated in different parts of the world under the FANG umbrella and uh, to, to a, hopefully to a degree can compare those data sets in a, in, a, in a useful way to conduct further research. And really we're trying to create a, adapt a data platform or community that's trying to ensure that all of the data is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So the metadata solution is, is very extensive. It's one of the, the sort of most extensive metadata solutions I've ever put together. It requires more than 200 different questions and to actually capture the wealth of different questions that people want to ask about their data, it has to constantly evolve. So recently we've expanded into aquaculture and also single cell sequencing and development of time points. So really have to uh, increase the, the amount of questions that we're able to capture about the data. And we control this terminology through standardized ontologies to try and make the downstream search and filtering as powerful as possible. And this is what we use to then drive the, the, the filters and the way you find data on the data portal. And this, uh, this sort of rich met metadata is only actually useful if people follow it. So we've developed a, a data submission system that um, has pre-submission validation. So it blocks people from submitting FANG data until they're compliant. And, but it also actually tries to highlight improvements as well. So um, suggest areas where they could have perhaps been more specific with an ontology and really try and ensure that, that they're being providing as much value um, for, the, for the data sets that they're pushing into the FANG project as possible. And to try and help people out, we actually have a brokered submission system so you don't have to do the, under, the submission to the public archives yourself. We'll do that on your behalf as long as you use our FANG website. And part of this is that we have mandatory protocols um, attached to every, um, every data set. So this is really enhancing the reproducibility because you can go and see really clearly how any data set has been generated, what was done with the sampling, what analysis that they performed. And we actually have a browser within the, the FANG data portal that you can go and look at all of the, the past data sets that have been generated, how everyone's done it. And this is really useful for then planning future studies. So you can see exactly what attack seek, um, attack seek protocol someone used to generate their data sets and try and follow that to try and be as standardized as possible. And this is sort of really, I think, a, a sort of key way that the community can, can gather and, and talk about and gather better ways of doing science. And we're now trying to, to extend this into the way data analysis as well. So we're trying to ensure that we develop a single set of open pipelines for the community that people can then reuse and as much as possible rather than generating new ones every time they're running an experiment. And so we're, we're basing this around the principles of open science and open source code, and reproducible workflows, and really trying to ensure that um, people reuse data, these analyses rather than a different one on every single um, set of data they generate. And the Eurofang projects are really exemplifying this um, with a sort of combined development approach through the NF Core community, which is this effort to try and collect and curate a, a set of really useful pipelines. So if you haven't heard of NF Core before, I'd really recommend you going and checking that out for, for how to do genomic analysis. And obviously there'll never be one pipeline that fits all. So we always, um, another aspect is to ensure that we're capturing really clearly all of the pipeline parameters that anyone's used within these pipelines. So that's captured along, alongside the data set so that you can have as much information as possible. So really what we're trying to show that for any given FANG data set, you have this collection of rich validated metadata, detailed protocols. We pull in legacy contextual data sets. You can try and understand it in more detail. There's then secondary annotations and analysis that have gone on in um, resources like Ensemble and FangMine, and then also access to the pipeline that generated the, data, the analysis data set and all of the parameters associated with that analysis. And then the range of papers that have then reused that data set. And this really, what we hope is that this provides as reusable a resource as possible for future, future studies. And then what we're trying to do is then assist you in actually identifying which data sets you want as these as we generate vastly more data, it then becomes harder and harder to actually find data that you need. Um, so we try and use this rich ontology information to drive filters on the website so you can narrow down to the data set you're interested in. We then use this information for sort of Google style searching within the site, um, but also then are passing this information on through the APIs to resources like FangMine that you'll hear about later, but also um, it is driving 
all of the improvements in, in annotations that you're seeing in resources like Ensemble. And what we've frequently seen as what's frequently known as a problem in agriculture is actually the ontologies that we're using are often very medical and model organism based. So one thing that we're trying to do, and, and, and um, I'm also involved in the AgBio data ontology um, working group and, and really looking forward to, to collaborating there. What we're trying to do is provide a way for our, our community to actually provide improvements and flag where there's problems. So we've um, launched this ontology improvement service. We're still very much working on this. So this allows users to, to list ontologies of importance for, for FANG, flag ontologies that they think might be wrong or might need improvements, and then also tell us about ones that they think are just completely missing. And then this system will then actually submit those underlying ontology improvements to, to the ontologies themselves and actually then drive um, slowly over time a crowdsourced improvement um, to the ontology landscape. Another issue I want to touch on is, is embargoes and, and third party restrictions. These are, are necessary in many contexts, but we really must recognize that they dampen some of this sort of acceleration and open reuse of data. Um, so FANG, for example, encourages pre-publication data archiving under the Fort Lauderdale agreements to facilitate data reuse. Um, so it's very clear about what you can and what you can't do um, with the FANG data set. And we've recently sort of um, revamped this wording to try and make it really clear to, to to data consumers to as to what they can do with FANG data sets. But I think as a community, and um, we really have a lot we can still do here to try and develop and then promote data openness, but also to be really clear about when these third party um, restrictions are required and be really clear about how they can be used and what people can do with different data sets. There's also a challenge around multiple references in data reuse. We have a need to potentially reanalyze past data and agree as a community when we need to switch to a new uh, reference genome. And also now that we have multiple breeds and multiple cultivars in different communities, and really need to ensure that all of this data is comparable and doesn't go out of date. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done around graph representations and scalabilities of these genome browsers to handle um, these multiple references. So some of the key gaps I think um, that the community FANG and the wider communities need to address are around standardized ontologies, both between um, crop and animal agriculture, but also to improve the ontologies themselves. Standardization, minimal metadata standards between some of these larger projects to make sure that we're in agreement. Um, making these data reuse conditions much clearer, particularly having machine readable third party constraints so that people can really um, pass these around and ensure that they're, they're followed. I think there's also a need for cloud-based pre-configured analysis. Um, so to try and lower the entry point for some groups to, to perform analyses. Um, if they don't have the resources within their own institutes, and then also then further standardized how we're performing a genotype to phenotype research. And obviously they're managing multiple references that I've already touched on. So I think FANG and then AgTPI and the AgBioData working groups are really the way that we're gonna drive this forward. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to continuing to work with these different communities. So really FANG promotes um, data reuse through data sets having this really rich metadata protocols, pre-publication data sharing, standardization around assays and the way that we're doing the analyses. And through this, we've actually produced some fantastic functional maps of some of these key animal species and we're continuing to broaden our scope. So if you haven't um, heard about what FANG is doing next, please Google FANG to fork and you can read our white paper about what we're planning on doing next. But really we're trying to, despite this expansion, maintain um, this sort of approach of our core values of reusability and data openness. And so I'm really keen um, to, to work with people to address this data torrent, these grand challenges that we have, uh, and looking forward to working with um, AgBioData and AgTPI to really promote data reuse, openness, and standardization. And I'd just like to, to thank um, the data coordination team at Emily BI, so Alexia, Chatter, Kusin, and Rahila, and the Eurofang projects, the Horizon 2020 um, grants that, that fund um, the data coordination work, and then also all of the members of the, the FANG steering committee and uh, the fan community that, that provide us so much helpful feedback and support. Great, thank you very much, Peter. Um, that's excellent. So, um, just to just to um, clarify, you're also interested in in doing similar work uh, for the plant community, uh, at least at least if if funding becomes available. So yeah, so so um, so so my other role is actually I'm part of the Ensemble Genomes Project. Um, so we support both animal and plant um, research. Um, so me and my colleague, Sarah Dyer, who leads on the, the plant agricultural side, um, are really obviously keen to, to, to promote EMBL's principles of, of data openness and, and to really help support um, people's <laughs> data archiving through the public archives and then presenting data through services like Ensemble 
uh, and then working with communities to try and standardize and, and promote um, data openness. Great, thank you very much. And there are some questions in the chat for you um, that I'd ask you to, to answer after we go to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Alenka Hafner. She's a graduate student at the Penn State University and she's studying plant phenotype plasticity, stress adaptation and epigenetic memory. And she wrote an intriguing paper recently on the student's perspective of uh, data reuse. And she will discuss that today. Her, her talk title is the reuse of public data sets, the potential risks and rewards from a student's perspective. So Alenka, go ahead. Thank you, Chris. I hope you can all see my presentation. Great. Um, so thank you for the great introduction. Uh, indeed, I'm a graduate student in plant biology at Penn State, uh, working in Sally McKenzie's group. Uh, but today I will present to you kind of a graduate student's perspective on the future of public data set reuse uh, in general in the life sciences. Uh, some of it overlaps with what we've heard today, but it's more general uh, in terms of life sciences and not just plant biology uh, or animal uh, sciences. Uh, my perspective was shaped with a collaboration uh, with bioinformaticians at the Center for Biotechnology at Bielefeld University, uh, where I did an internship, uh, which yielded a review paper uh, on the topic. So this is the major problem that we're facing in the field. Uh, as you can see in the background, the total amount of bases uploaded to SRA continues to grow. Uh, which poses a challenge not only for the database storage capacities, but to the life sciences community in general. So how do we uh, wrangle all this data and get meaningful information out of it? Uh, in a perfect world, we will be able to extract all this information and it would be accompanied by perfect metadata uh, that can allows us to reuse this data completely uh, risk-free. Uh, however, not all data is created equal when it comes to reuse utility, and I think everyone uh, who's ever tried to reuse data sets realizes that. Um, so this is kind of the conclusion I've come to uh, through uh, examining uh, reuse examples and through my own research. Uh, and that is to enable productive reuse, we as a community must implement rigorous data and experimental uh, design standards that are specific to field and data type. Um, and I will kind of take you through uh, how I came uh, to this conclusion now. Uh, to kind of spoil the ending uh, through the literature re review we did with the researchers at Bielefeld University, we found that the benefits of reuse outweigh the risks and limitations overall. However, we should obviously be aware of both uh, to make informed decisions about reuse and establish useful community standards for all of us to follow. Um, here are just some of the main rewards of successful use, which have been demonstrated through the talks we heard today and kind of uh, the excellent um, research outputs uh, that are enabled by reuse. Um, and that is obviously um, novel scientific findings. Um, this, the kind of main benefit of reuse is quite obvious to everyone. We're preventing information loss and expanding scientific knowledge. Uh, so meta-analysis and new tools can be applied to all data sets, uh, which yields new hypotheses uh, and obviously conclusions. Uh, this makes economic sense uh, as the utility of these data sets, which are often produced at extraordinary cost and effort uh, and time, increases uh, through reuse. Um, and there are also associated benefits for authors and databases, which uh, are not often discussed. Uh, as a data producer, you yourself may gain a reputation uh, through high quality data set production. Um, further, reuse benefits groups and young researchers with uh, smaller budgets, as they can harness uh, the power of much larger uh, analysis. Uh, and the benefits for databases and repositories is kind of evident from this uh, figure from our paper. Uh, please note the logarithmic y-axis. Um, so it has been shown that the nucleotide and proteomics data generation rate is growing faster than storage capacities in those areas. Uh, therefore, recycling data and not just producing new data sets when one of high quality is already available uh, will become of growing importance uh, in the future as well. 
so the benefits of reuse are also reflected in the historical evolution of researcher behavior. Uh, at the beginning of the big data revolution, it was actually the rate uh, of technological advance that was limiting to reuse. Uh, but once data accessibility was widespread through the internet, uh, sharing behavior was established and reuse became a more attractive option. Um, and researcher behavior also establishes a positive feedback loop, uh, as more reuse leads to benefits becoming more convincing to more groups. Um, therefore, reuse went from possible to easy and is currently hopefully transitioning into a habit for more and more groups. However, um, as we also heard today, uh, reuse comes with its own challenges and risks. Um, the major one is that you don't know what you're getting a lot of the time. Um, the lack of meta information is rarely addressed completely by peer review. And once the data is public, um, it is a very difficult problem to overcome, uh, kind of go back and curate. Um, similarly, uh, we can have the normalization uh, of data sets, which also occurs due to unknown quality. Uh, this is the circular reuse within a database that can lead to, for example, propagation of erroneous annotation or skewing of data distribution uh, due to duplication of data sets. Um, one additional problem that I think we've all faced at some point or another uh, is integration. Uh, so how do you combine different data types and structures? Uh, this makes analysis uh, very difficult. Uh, however, it has been successfully uh, tackled by uh, some examples of databases, for example, FANG. Uh, finally, there are research integrity questions that must be discussed, um, and there are different perspectives uh, which people have uh, on reuse. And I really hope we can have a productive discussion on the issue through uh, AG2PI. Um, is reuse our obligation when that is possible at all costs? Uh, there's also been perspectives put forward uh, in publications that it is simply research parasitism. Um, obviously, there is a fruitful discussion to be had on the issue. Um, and the possible solutions to these limitations that I've presented are obviously reanalysis and more meta information, um, which sounds easy in a perfect world. All data sets would be subject to curation um, and would have complete meta information. But this is heavily constrained by database uh, funding. So we must work within the limits of the resources that we have. So now I'd like to show you another side of reuse, uh, a very practical hands-on example of my day-to-day -day experience with reuse. So I'm showing you here a well-managed repository, well-funded, containing the data from the famous 1001 Arabidopsis Genomes Project. Um, here is how time-consuming it is to access just one run of a bisulfate sequencing experiment for one accession of Arabidopsis. Uh, but the bigger problem in my example is not how many clicks it takes me to get to a specific file, uh, is that the replicate numbers are too small and or inconsistent. So in order for me to use a statistically robust tool for methylome analysis, I would need at least three runs for each accession, um, which would allow me to distinguish statistically meaningfully between the noise and signal of differential methylation. Uh, however, some accessions here have seven, some three, some two, and some even just one run. And Columbia Zero, our reference in the field, has just one run. Um, so what does this say about the reusability with one of the most expensive to produce data sets uh, in my field? So kind of what I wanted to uh, show you with that example is that even if the limitations that I had described previously uh, are overcome with meta information and curation, the problem of poor data quality will still remain to some extent. So to enable the productive reuse, um, we must uphold rigorous data and experimental standards when we are uploading our data already. Um, so saving one sequencing run might seem economical in the short term for that one group, uh, but makes that data completely unreusable in the future, in addition to being a statistically dodgy approach. So we must produce statistically meaningful data with emerging data types and possible future approaches in mind now when we are producing the data. So these types of data would include the metalome, the metabolome, phenotypic data, which is what we discussed today. 
Otherwise, we will end up with databases chock full of unreusable data. Um, to come back to an example from my own uh, research, signal detection is an emerging approach to tackle data sets with high statisticity. Uh, however, it requires high quality data sets. Um, and an issue that the medical and pharma field are already aware of with their own data sets. Uh, so it seems that the vast majority of the available data, uh, which was produced again at extraordinary costs, is not usable for this specific uh, emerging approach. Uh, further, uh, computational biology students are not adequately trained to deal with the issue when they come up against these types of data sets. Sorry about that. So uh, in summary, uh, it's not so bleak. Uh, the benefits of reuse indeed outweigh the risks. Uh, and we must step together as a community to ensure that the future of reuse um, with new tools will be successful as well, uh, which means we need rigorous standards that must be uh, up upheld and must be compiled by field experts uh, and not just organism specific, but also data type specific. Um, which I think um, is part of the discussion uh, that I'd like to have as someone uh, working with emerging data types and tools. So thank you very much um, for a hosting this workshop uh, and for the lovely introductions. I'd like to thank my co-authors, Boaz Parker and Catherine Zielman from Bielefeld and my current group uh, at Penn State. And I'm very happy to discuss uh, any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elenka. That, that was a great uh, uh, discussion on, on some of the issues that, that we need to face um, in this field. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't checked to see if there are questions for you, but, but hopefully there are um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the chat. And I think we'll go ahead and, and go on to the, the last speaker before the uh, discussion time. And that's Christine Elsick who is a professor um, with a joint appointment in both plant and animal sciences departments um, at the University of Missouri. And her research focus is on genome annotation and developing tools to make uh, such data available to the community. And her talk today is entitled, Making Fang Data Reusable in Fang Mine. So Christine, go ahead. Thank you. So, um... I'm going to be talking about FangMind today, which is a database that we're, um, we've created to integrate um, data for the species of interest to the um, Fang Consortium. But I also want to mention that we have a similar project for MazeMind in collaboration with MazeGDB. We have different sources of data for MazeMind, but it's, the idea will be similar. So the thing that I want to focus on today is um, is really the, the FANG data that we've um, incorporated. And uh, this is the, um, the homepage for FANG mine. And I'm gonna just point out some of the tools that I'll talk about today. There's a query builder, a list tool for uploading IDs, and then a region search tool that um, you can actually search for um, features in genomic regions. Um, in the middle of the page, we show this, um, this bar that goes across that has um, different categories of, of queries that we call template queries. And I'll be focusing on queries um, related to the FANG data. So if we just look at some of those queries available, um, they're shown here. Uh, if you want to perform a, a query, you just click on one of these um, and you'll get to a, a menu uh, that will allow you to um, select some kind of constraint. So here's just one of the, um, the queries if you want to just list all the FANG chip seek experiments for a particular organism. And so right now we have um, this kind of data only for, for horse, so that's selected by default. If we want to actually look at the results, we would click on show results, or we could click um, edit query and look at the, um, the query builder. And I'll be showing the query builder a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, if we click show results, we'll get the output of, of the query and um, the outputs are always in a, a um, tabular format where um, icons above all the columns allow you to do filtering and in different kinds of um, changes to your output. And you can also export your output in tab delimited format. So I'm going to focus on this um, on data, the FANG metadata right now, the kind of data that we've incorporated to, um, to be able to really reuse and explore the FANG data. And so here um, is showing the model browser on the left side, which is 
basically a, a kind of a tree-like structure of, of the data classes and their attributes. And you can root the tree at pretty much any, kind, any data class that you're interested in. So this is just if we wanna look at experiment data. So this data, um, the experiment data we collected from um, the sequence read archive. So you can see that a lot of the, the data here is, is the exact data that you would get if you would download that from NCBI. Um, on, the, uh, on the right side, we see the actual query. So that the, um, everything shown in blue rectangles are gonna be columns that, that have been selected for output. And then there's also places that show constraints. So this query was constrained for, for one organism. Um, and then also constrained to show um, chip seek experiments. Um, if you um, scroll down the model browser, you can see all um, the other data types that are actually um, connected to experiments. So we have the bio project, um, we have analyses. And I wanna point out that, um, that we get this analysis data from the FANG data portal. So the FANG data portal has really facilitated our ability to do this because um, the FANG data portal is really the only resource that that really um, provides this kind of standardized format for some of the different kinds of uh, analysis kind of attributes. And um, I actually wish that this was available for, for Maze, for Maze Mind. So I'm really glad to hear that, you know, it's, there's a possibility that, that that work would go on forward with plants. If we scroll down a little bit more, we can see um, the different kinds of biosample data we have. And this is also really facilitated by the FANG project because um, um, as Peter mentioned, there's, um, there are you know, 200 questions that are asked when people submit their data. And so this is captured, a lot of it's captured in the biosample data, which then we're able to capture because it's in a standardized format. And then you know, if you just keep going down, here's even more of the biosample data. So, uh, I wanna point out that um, people can, the, the query builder is a pretty complex tool, but, um, but people can actually change their queries. For example, if somebody wanted to change um, this query so that it showed a different organism, they can click on this uh, a little blue icon next to the constraint um, and it opens up a window that would have a pull down menu or some of the constraints have free form text entry and then you can just um, add that to your query. So, um, so that's really what I wanted to show you with the FANG metadata, but really the, what the metadata is for is, is really so that it can help you um, uh, filter to the data that you wanna look for. And so we have, um, we've collected so far the equine histone marks that have been published, and we've actually um, assigned unique identifiers to, to all of the histone marks. And so that they're actually um, loaded as objects in the database. And I'm gonna show an example of how you can search this data. And so in this example, we're gonna use a list tool to upload some SNP IDs to get coordinates. We use a region search tool to identify um, histone marks that overlap those SNP. Then we'll also use uh, the region search tool again to look for genes near those histone marks. Then we'll use a template query to determine gene expression levels and then JBrowse to view um, genomic context of the histone marks. So to start out, um, we have some IDs for um, SNPs associated with osteochondrosis, which we got from animal QTLDB. And these are just um, pasted into a box um, in the list tool upload. And so we select the um, data type, which is SNP in the organism and say, create list. The first thing that happens is that the database performs a validation on whether the, these IDs are in the database. And so um, I entered 44 identifiers, but only 43 were found in the database. So it, it lists the one that wasn't found. So we're gonna save that as a list. And once we save the list, um, it gives us to this kind of default output for that data type that just shows some information. And so this shows the, um, uh, you know, reference and alternate you know, alleles and also the locations of the SNP. And so it shows both the start and the end coordinate, but all those are actually the same because it's a SNP. Um, but I wanna, um, the reason why we have both of these available is because the region search um, actually requires a start and an end. So um, we're going to export these coordinates in the SNP. Um, and then we're going to, once we export those, we're gonna be able to use those in a region search. So in the region search page, um, We've, we've developed it so that you can um, open up a faceted selector and be able to select individual experiments, individual FANG experiments. And so we're just gonna select all of, the, all of them, the ones that are available, um, and then we'll paste in our SNP locations, which shows the chromosome start and end. 
and um, we'll just click run um, search. Um, first, we get to a, sort of a preliminary output page that, um, that shows the results for each individual region that we uploaded. And so you can see some have no features, but then you see that there is also some, um, some histone marks that overlap the, um, the SNP that were SNP regions. Um, so since uh, something that has facilitated um, us being able to do this is that um, the, um, the group, the researchers have submitted their analysis data to the, um, and made it available to the FANG data portal. And there's an, uh, an analysis accession number that we assign, we include as part of a unique identifier for this data. So that has really helped um, for us to um, be able to organize the data. And so we have two kinds of identifiers associated with it. We'll have like a, the analysis along with sort of just a, a unique a number. And then we'll also have a um, sort of a, an ID that is more descriptive that shows that the histone mark the, um, the tissue and then the location. And so for the rest of the um, example, I'm just gonna focus in the histone marks that overlap this one particular region. And so I'm gonna actually click this button go so that um, it actually saves these histone marks in a list. And so here I have a list of two hist histone marks. And the reason why I did that is because I wanna be able to export the, um, the locations of these histone marks um, be able to be able to use that again in a region search. Um, so here I'll do the region search again, but this time I'm only searching for genome features, so I don't have the, the long list of histone modifications. I'm going to search for gene, ex extend my search by 3 KB, um, and then when I do that, I can find um, one of the uh, marks is within um, 3 KB of two genes, and there's one that's near, near one of those genes. And then I save those genes as a list, and um, I'm going to go do a template query where I can um, I can actually use that list of genes in a, um, in a search for gene expression. And I get my results um, of, of where these genes are expressed in, in all the tissues. Um, but I'm only interested in adipose because those, um, those uh, marks were, were in the adipose tissue. So I can filter to save only those. And then, um, so we have two genes um, that were expressed in the adipose, well, actually really low level in the adipose tissue. So if I click on this fangmine.org link here at the top of the page, we can go to the, um, the homepage and it has a, a pull down menu for JBrowse where um, we can go to the genome browser. We can just paste in coordinates to zoom into the region. Um, and here showing the SNP that, for that region. And then here are the two marks. And if, if we zoom out, there's the SNP and then we can see the two, uh, the two um, genes on both sides and then we can, you know, look around and see what other marks are nearby. So, um, so to conclude, I, uh, I've shown that the FangMine and JBrowse can be used to explore a context of the Fang sequence annotation data. So this is, you know, this is um, similar to what was mentioned earlier, where we're looking at the actual data uh, points, the marks themselves, not not downloading um, entire data sets. So Fang allows you to do this fine grain searching of the data. Um, the availability of the FANG metadata really facilitates being able to, um, to, to do flexible and detailed queries. Um, we currently have RNA-seq gene expression levels for all the species in FANG, uh, um, in FANG mine, and then we have the um, FANG sequence annotated for only horse right now, but we're working on to get additional published FANG sequence annotated, annotation data sets. Um, so I'd like to ask the FANG researchers, please submit your analysis data to the, um, the European Nucleotide Archive. Um, the FANG Data Coordination Center has guidelines for doing that. And um, I'm, you know, people are really good at submitting their, their sample data, but, but please remember to also submit your, your bed files and your analysis data at the end, and that will really help in the data reuse. Um, I'd like to uh, thank my co-PIs and the FANG Mine advisors then also, um, especially Deb and Amy, who are the developers of the current release of FangMine. And I'd also like to point out that we have, um, we're planning tutorials coming up uh, in April. Great, thanks very much, Christine. Um, thank, uh, thanks to all the speakers. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, you know, really applaud everyone. Um, I think it was a great survey of all the different um, efforts that's going on, uh, at least some of the efforts that are going on. And you can see how broad this is, really broad questions and, and a lot of different um, interested groups uh, de developing tools as well as developing discussions. 
Um, uh, I would like to uh, uh, just indicate also that there are questions in the chat. So, and I appreciate that. I think most of those are being answered um, by the speakers or by others. Um, we did have a little bit of trouble with uh, the chat. It looks like if you're not a co-host, you can't send the question to the entire audience. Um, and so Nicole is is relaying those. Um, and so we apologize for that. We're not exactly sure why that's happening, but it that's seems where actually Chris now. Yes, I, I figured it's it out. Now? Anyone okay. can chat again. Sorry okay. about. That. Good, good. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks for working on that, Nicole. So I, we're on time. That's really terrific. And I'm going to turn it over to James Coltis, who will sort of be the moderator for the roundtable discussion. Um, and I think he has some slides he wants to show. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, all the speakers. And thanks for your participation.